going to uh, have prayer, and then um, I'm going to bring Mike up here. We're going to do just a real short kind of an interview. So uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time that we get to uh, share here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for creating the Ministry of the Theological Education Initiative. Thank you for those who give and support it generously so that we can, Lord, just uh, never keep anyone away. So thank you for the generosity of those friends. And for our time, Lord, tonight and tomorrow in the workshops that will happen, Lord, in all of it, um, we, we want to get to know you better, fall in love with you, and we want to be able to serve, Lord, in our evangelistic effort, be prepared and ready to give an answer. Pray for Mike as he comes. He'll have uh, just a freedom in the spirit to uh, share what you prepared him for. Thank you for he and his family and his willingness to make the sacrifices he makes to come. So bless him in that. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. We ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. Come on up. Give a warm Central Missouri welcome to Dr. Michael Thank you. Why don't you get ready? All right, so I always like to throw uh, hard questions early. Let me see if I can think of one. Um, when you were young, were you an academic or did school come? Does it kind of surprise you to have the kind of interest that you have? Yeah, I, I was definitely a late bloomer. Um, I was a straight C minus student all the way up through high school. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, probably a C plus student in college. And um, but uh, I think, as I said earlier at the school today, uh, I had a learning disability, ADD, uh, which means attention deficit squirrel. <laughs> and, um, plus, I have an average IQ. My dad told me the number I'm not going to share, but um, it's completely average. So because when I got to grad school, I got passionate about the topic. I was willing to put a whole lot of work. And when you're passionate about what you're studying or doing, it makes up for a lot of what you may lack in natural talent. I think that's so important to say. I, I do tell people as younger folks that you know I went to a seminary on academic probation. They had a great point average that I didn't have. And uh, but the longer you go, the more they let you study what you want. And so <laughs> you sort of like to keep going. You don't have to deal with math and English and all those kinds of things. So that, that's really curious. You are passionate, uh, and I have learned this about you. You're very passionate about research, yeah. and 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 the study and the preparation and being prepared, like ADD squirrel kind of a deal. I mean, you you're you're. Like in, ready, working, those kinds of things uh, along the way. And then there's the, the presentation that you love as well. But it's really rooted in a lot of self-discipline, not just your, your, your doctoral work but, and, and, and master's, but also it's rooted in like hours and hours and hours of sitting behind a desk. Can you talk about what that looks like? You do that at home, I assume? Yeah. Uh, so... Now, I teach at Houston Baptist University, but I have a really unique uh, position with them. So I'm considered full-time faculty, but they are working, they have, we're trying to get all their programs online, uh, undergrad and grad, and their one graduate program that I work a lot with is their Master of Arts in Christian Apologetics, which can be completed at entirely at distance. So right now I'm teaching a course, and one of my students lives in Germany. Um, so, most of my students are professionals, they're pharmacists and attorneys and CPAs and all kinds of people that have, they, um, I've got one right now, really sharp, one of my sharpest students, and she's a home mom, you know, yeah. uh, really sharp. So, uh, but those are my students, they're peppered all throughout the country, sometimes out of the country, and so I get to teach them, it's really cool. But, uh, so I work a lot at home, I'm on the road maybe 50, 60, 65 days a year. Um, but I'm, I'm home a lot, so I get to spend a lot of time in research and writing, and I really enjoy that. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that, like, like the whole debate, it's not really, you know, yet been something I've been, it's not our vibe, so to speak. But you think they're powerful, because you've done 30-some of them, 32 right? of them, yeah. They are powerful. I've seen people come to know Christ through debates. I get emails quite often about people who watched the debate that I did 
Um, I mean, those are, these are viewed quite often online. Some of them are viewed, you know, a few thousand times online, uh, depending on the person. Uh, my debate two years ago with Matt Dilla, honey, between my channel and his, they viewed almost 400,000 times. Wow. Uh, my debate last year with Bart Ehrman has been viewed, I think, close to 200,000 times. So um, I do have people say that they become Christians as a result of watching it, or that they, I've had people tell me they've devoted themselves to full-time Christian ministry as a result of watching it. Um, a debate out in Topeka, Kansas a few years ago at Washburn University, girl came up to me and, and told me she was, she came into the school as a Christian, left the Christian faith her first semester, came to the debate that evening as a non-believer, and left as a believer. So uh, I couldn't wait to get back into study. So yeah, there's a lot that goes on with these. Um, at UCLA, when I debated there a few years ago, a student emailed me later that night and told me that he and a few other Christian students on the front row, they were so encouraged because they were getting their debate just put down constantly by professors there. And he said, this really gave us a lot of confidence. And that guy went into full, ended up, he was a psychology major, he ended up going to seminary to become a full-time uh, Christian minister. Wow. Now, I just I just find myself thinking, uh, that's just not me. When, when did it, the idea first, you thought, this is, this is who I am, I want to do this? Yeah, I guess it's um, just a matter of personality. So the first time I ever really uh, took an interest in Christian debates, I heard William Lane Craig debate Frank Zindler. And this was back in the late 1990s. And for Christmas, I asked my wife to get me uh, the audio cassette tapes of that. And then I got two audio cassette tapes of another debate Bill Craig did with John Dominic Crossan on the Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And I just listened to those over and over and over, and I thought, this is just amazing. And and Bill Craig, I mean, he there's there are scholars, there's Bill Craig, yeah. and and there's the rest of us mortals, you know. Um, <laughs> and he's just he's the finest Christian debater I think the world has ever seen, and I think he's he's perhaps the finest Christian apologist the world has ever seen. And um, I was just mesmerized by these debates, and I said, well, I'll never be able to do that, because I mean, this guy's brilliant, and I hadn't even finished my master's, and he had two or doctorates. Um, but then, uh, a few years later, that was like 1998, 1999, and then 2003 came up, I had just gotten into a PhD program, accepted into it, and someone asked Gary Habermas, a mentor of mine, to debate, uh, Dan Barker at the University of Wisconsin. He's the head of the Freedom from Found Freedom from Religion Foundation and tries to, I mean, it just calls all sorts of trouble. And um, so he said he didn't want to do it, and then he asked me if I'd want to do it. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And I said, but do you think I can win? He said, well, he's an experienced debater. It was going to be his 39th debate, and this would be my first. And he said, but you probably know the topic better than Parker does, because it would be the resurrection. And uh, I said, okay. So I did it in April 2003, and even the atheist organization that invited Parker said that I won. <laughs> so uh, I just got the bug at that point, and it's never left. I just, I love it. I spent a lot of time preparing, and um, yeah, so I just love doing it. It's a, I guess it's just a quirk of my personality. Our, our debates never get heated. I'm friends with most of my debate. I saw Dan Bark a couple weeks ago, went up and hugged him. You know, and um, so, uh, I mean, we're just friends and stuff, but uh, I just love doing it. It's fun, and I see the, the fruit that comes as a result of it. It just mm -hmm. makes me really excited. Yeah, very cool. Um, now, you know, when, when you're on my end, you had probably hadn't been on my end and actually invited someone in, but let me tell you about me and what it's like to bring Mike Lacuna. Because you don't know if the persons um, can adapt to the situation. Meaning, like, do they just stand behind the lectern and do they read it or are they able to... So what I've appreciated is that in the settings that we've been in so far, first of all, you're not tied to the notes. But more than that, you, like, know the material and today you are talking through with us out loud in conversation with like the president of CCCB. I think I'm gonna like do this and how about if I do that because 
the material that you're covering, you know so well, you can package it in 40 minutes, you can package it in 40 hours, you can package it in 400 weeks, right? I mean, it's kind of like that. And so you're... 400 weeks. Okay. <laughs> 40 weeks. The flood, the come and go. But anyway, the, uh, the basic idea is that you, 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 you know the material well enough. And so it, the presentation, I hadn't told you this yet, but I really appreciate the fact that you, know, you can be in the room as well as be in the research and to serve as well. And thanks for saying yes like a year ago to come to Central Missouri. So yeah, I hope you feel for, what do you, what do you like about Central Missouri for, so far? Like what's the most impressive other than hanging out? Yeah, just all the people because Missouri is impressive. Exactly. <laughs> just, you, you, my, my wife's from Nebraska, from Nebraska City, which is 45 minutes south of Omaha. And I tease her all the time, you know, just Nebraska's boring. Uh, your town that you're from is like a clearing in a cornfield, and um, and she wouldn't even want to move back there now, you know. But um, but no, the people out here, of course, Midwesterners are just salt of the earth, just wonderful. People. Your first time to Central Missouri, right? You've been to Missouri, but your first I mean, time. Missouri is my first but time. But not Central Missouri. Well, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. All right, another applause, and then you just go, man. Just give it to us, and. You run with it when you're done. Uh, we'll see how much time we got. You Q and A that kind of thing. Blin. Okay, I'm gonna go adjust that. So I'll, I'll set this back up, and I'll uh, hopefully improve it. If not, then you just grab this microphone. Okay. So let me ask you all: um, If I came down and stood in front, would that be okay? Yes. yes. All right. I feel detached up here. <laughs> Well, we're going to start, I'm going to show a one minute video that uh, will set the stage. fixing that, I'll tell you about a, something that happened to me in South Africa a few years ago. So uh, there's hardly any hotels over there. I've been there a few times to lecture. And so they, they don't have these hotels, they have these, uh, they call them guest homes. They're like bed and breakfast places. <coughs> and so a person, a family will own this and then they have all these other rooms. And it's it's not really, it is kind of connected, but it's, I don't know, anyway, it's, it's good. But <laughs> So I walk into this one in Pretoria, because I'm going to be lecturing in that city for a little bit. And I walk up to the desk to sign in, and sweet lady, probably in her uh, early 70s, her and her husband own the place. And um, as she walks back, she says, I'll be right with you, honey. And as I'm there, I see on this like column, you know, something like one of these columns sticking up here, I see this real big, furry, brown spider on it, right about head height. And you can't hear me with this? Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me turn this off so this isn't messed up. All right, so um, I, I see this spider, and I'm thinking, man, I don't like that thing. Not at all. <laughs> and um, so I'm thinking of smashing it, of kicking this thing. I used to be in the martial arts, so I might like to get there. I think it was kicking this thing, but I thought, you know, this is Africa, and I don't know what spiders here do. Is this thing just, is it going to be lightning quick and start hopping away and then jump on me, or what's going to happen? And, and if I smash this thing on the column, this woman comes back, is she going to get angry for messing up her place? Um, uh, you know, what, what's, so I better just leave this thing alone. I don't know if it's a um, poisonous spider or what. So uh, I leave it alone, and then I go out, I check into my room, and it's very clean up there. And the next morning, I come down for breakfast, and this lady says to me, um, she says, well, honey, how do you like your room? And I said, it is very clean, it's very comfortable, I love it, it's, it's neat. I said, but I do have a question for you. She said, what's that? 
And I said, well, when I checked in yesterday, there was this big furry brown spider. Oh, yeah, honey, don't worry about those. Uh, they won't hurt you. Uh, they eat bugs. I said, okay. Well, my room is so clean. I looked around, I didn't see a single spider or, or bug, not so much as a tiny little gnat or a flea in or anything. I didn't see anything. And I said, I, I'm just curious how you keep it so bug free. Because, you know, I'm looking in the United States, you know, we've got these doors that go outside and there's these little rubber things that go around to keep bugs from coming in. I said, but, you know, right across the street is, a, is a, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a wildlife refuge or something, you know. And I said, there's a, you don't have this rubber thing under the door, and so, you know, a little snake or a spider could, you know, all kinds of critters could come in. How do you keep the, what do you spray it with? I want to know what you guys spray it with to keep it so clean and free of pets. Well, honey, we don't spray our rooms. I said, well, how do you keep it, you know, from spiders like this getting in? She said, well, honey, they're there. They just come out at night to eat. <laughs> well, I didn't need to know that. <laughs> so let me tell you, for the next two nights, the lights did not go off in my room. And, uh, so are we ready? Let's try it. Few positions are better suited for impact than safety. A few people play safety better than the Ravens and me. I'm sorry for him right now. sport. I've got a friend named Mike DeVito. He played nine years in the NFL. Um, he just finished a program a year ago at, at HE. He retired from the NFL and, and got in our program in Masters of Arts in Apologetics at, at Houston Baptist. And um, so he played with the Jets and then he went to the, the Chiefs. Well, that's right, we're near Chiefs, right? So Mike DeVito, does that number, I think he was number 70, he played defensive, uh, I don't know, it was defensive line, he, he tried to stop the running back is what he would do, so I don't know what position that is, but really cool guy, I really like him, And uh, but he's got permanent shoulder injuries, had shoulder surgery, he gets in constant pain, he says, uh, you know, we'll probably need another shoulder surgery, and it's going to be chronic pain. My first debate with Bart Ehrman was in Kansas City back in 2008, and we had dinner beforehand, and one of the guys we had dinner with uh, sitting at our table was a guy named Chad Gailey, who had been the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs at that time. And so I started asking him questions. I said, well, well coach, uh, what about all these players in the NFL? When they retire, if they've been playing for years, um, what kind of shape are they in? What kind of pain do they have? He said, well, all of them chronic pain for the rest of their lives. I said, everyone? He said, yeah, except maybe the kicker. Uh, and I said, well, if I ever got in the NFL, I'd want to be the kicker. So, uh, but consider that all of those hits that they take all over the body it causes that permanent damage, and that is with all the gear, the protective gear that you're wearing, it still impacts them. The most important piece of gear that they are wearing, of course, is the helmet, right? Because you could break your shoulder, collarbone, all that. You could get paralyzed and all that, but you get some nasty hits in the head, and it could take your life. So you don't want to pull any uh, a budget. You don't want to buy a budget helmet. You want to have the best out there, right? You want to invest in it to make sure you've got the best kind of, of equipment for the head. So I think about that, and I think about what happens when we send our kids off to secular universities that they go and they get to get all these head blows 
first day of class, it's like in the movie, God is not dead. I've spoken on more than a hundred university campuses across the country, and I can tell you that there are many universities, even in the Bible Belt, where on the first day of class, the professor will say, how many of you are Christians? And my goal is by the end of the semester, you will no longer be a Christian. And they'll say that to Christians, of course, but no one will say, how many of you are Muslims? Or imagine if a Christian professor said, how many of you are atheists? And you can get away with it when you're an atheist professor coming against Christianity. And then they'll have all kinds of attacks. You know, what about all the errors and contradictions in Gospels? What about the dying and rising figures in pagan uh, parallel accounts? What about uh, the Babylonian uh, stories that are parallel to some of those in the Old Testament? What about the genocide in the Old Testament? We can't really believe in miracles. The Bible's filled with myths and just false stories. We can't believe it. And our kids don't know how to answer that because they've not received any kind of training. It's just a matter of how the, the, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, right? But then they go to school, and then their professors say you can't believe the Bible, and then their whole foundation starts to collapse. They get all these head blows. And they don't know what to do because we haven't provided any kind of head protection. And that's why I am very excited about the Theological Education Initiative. I'm excited about that university, the college, the Central Christian Bible College of the Bible, because they are teaching, they are equipping our students today so that they can answer those kinds of objections. Well, over the years, um, I've found that there are five major objections that skeptics give against the Gospels. And I would like to cover four of those and partially cover a fifth one tonight. So I call, I put these together and I call them the ABCs, Ds, and Es of defending the Gospels. And you'll understand why I say that. So the first major objection is authorship, A for authorship. And critics, skeptics will say, we have no idea who wrote the Gospels. The Gospels are anonymous. So when we look in our New Testaments, we see a title in front of all of our Gospels. The Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. They will say in our oldest manuscripts, those titles do not appear. So they are anonymous, and there is nowhere throughout our Gospels, any of them, where it identifies and say, I, John, am the author, or I, Luke, am the author. The only way we know that who the authors are is from these titles, and since they weren't in the originals or our oldest manuscripts, then they're, in a sense, very real sense, they're anonymous. We don't know who they are, and so we don't get the titles that are coming on until sometime in the second century. So if we don't know who wrote them, how can we know that they're even reliable? Well, it is true that the titles don't appear in our oldest manuscripts. And in a sense, the Gospels, because it doesn't give us, uh, uh, the author doesn't identify themselves by name, in a, in, a, in a sense, they are anonymous. But that is entirely irrelevant to whether we know who wrote the Gospels. And let me explain why. All of these authors here, these are just some of them. Caesar, in his Civil War, when he's writing on the Civil War, it's anonymous. He's writing, and he'll mention Caesar in the third person. So he doesn't, if someone was reading Caesar's Civil War, his commentaries on the Civil War, we wouldn't know that it was Julius Caesar who wrote it because he doesn't identify himself and he speaks of himself as though, in another, as though it's a different person. Sallust is one of the greatest of the Roman historians. In fact, in the late first century, Quintilian said that Sallust was a better historian than Livy and that one must be well advanced in their studies in order to appreciate it properly. Sallust wrote about the war with Catiline, the war with uh, Jugurtha, and he wrote histories of Rome. And all of them are anonymous. And then you've got Livy, the great Roman historian. His writings, anonymous. Then you have Plutarch, who is known to be the greatest of all ancient biographers, whether Greco, Greek or Roman. And much of what we know about the ancient world comes from Plutarch. He wrote over 60 biographies, of which 50 have survived, 
And you know how many times his name appears in them at all? Zero. It's not in the title. His name appears nowhere. And yet, do you know that there is a, there aren't, we don't find for Caesar, Sallust, Living Plutarch, we don't find scholars, classicists who are saying, no, they didn't write those things. In fact, I talked to uh, the leading Sallust scholar in the world, he's a friend of mine, and he says that when it comes to his war with Ugartha and his war with Catiline, it's unanimous that he wrote those. And it's unanimous that he wrote just about all the histories. There are a few parts that some people dispute in there, but otherwise it's, it's undisputed. Plutarch, I talked to the leading Plutarch scholar in the world, Christopher, Plunk, uh, Christopher Pelling, who uh, retired from Oxford a few years ago, and he says all of Plutarch's lives, undisputed that he wrote them. Yet his name doesn't appear in any of them. There are, all these things are anonymous in the same, se same sense. Uh, Plato, Porphyry, Galen, many other ancient authors, their writings, anonymous. Yeah, we don't question who wrote those. How do we know who wrote them? Well, that's a great question. So let's look at Plutarch's lives. Plutarch wrote these somewhere between the year 90 and 120, maybe a couple years after 120. Okay, how do we know he wrote the lives? Well, the major source for it is something called the Lamprius Catalog. And that was written somewhere minimum of 100 years after Plutarch's death. We don't know exactly, but it was at least 100 years, and it may have been a little more than 200 years after his death. And that is our first, our major source to know that Plutarch wrote them. And, get this, it's falsely attributed to Plutarch's son, Lamprius. He didn't write it. And yet, that's our major source to know that Plutarch wrote it. Nobody disputes, no classic, classicist today disputes that Plutarch wrote the lives. Because that is enough for them. And we really don't have any competing accounts that said, well, Plutarch didn't write those and attributed it to someone else. So they were always attributed to Plutarch, and so we don't dispute that. When it comes to the Gospels, here are our first sources that attribute them. So you got Papias, and he attributes it to Mark and Matthew. Marcion, around 145, attributes it to Luke. Uh, the Gospel to Luke, you got Justin around the year 150. He talks about Mark and Luke. Irenaeus, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and on and on. And then even past there, there are some that, that mention the Gospel. So I'm just talking, you know, for the first maybe um, 125 years, 135, 40 years after the last Gospel was written. These are all the sources. And yet, we only have that one source for Plutarch that was written between 100 and a little over 200 years that talk about Plutarch. So we got a lot of sources that talk about the Gospels, and with two, only two exceptions to John's Gospel, which for various reasons you can put those away, because one certainly confused and the other was a Gnostic, it's unanimous that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote those Gospels is the testimony of the early church. Now let me just give you one of these, and that's Pat, uh, uh, I guess I don't get into it in this one. But I'll tell you, Papias, he tells us where he got his information from. The Lamprius catalog is falsely attributed to his son. Um, for Sallust, for his war with Catiline and his war with Jugurtha that he wrote, our first source for that is Quintilian. And he's writing at least 135 to 140 years later. And he doesn't tell us what his source is for that information. When we're looking at Mark and Matthew, our first source is Papias. And Papias said he got his information from an associate of John the son of Zebedee. And then he received this information while John was still preaching. That's amazing! And this is what we have for, the, for those. So it's pretty cool. We're, we, um, yes, they're anonymous in a, in a strict sense, you could say. But we have good reason for believing the gospel authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, there is some dispute about John and Matthew. But I do think that however we, uh, uh, whatever conclusion we arrive at, that it is still seems to be the case that Matthew and John were involved in the penning of the Gospels, whether they wrote it or they were interviewed, they were still behind us, rooted in their eyewitness testimony. 
All right, the B stands for bias, and you'll hear this, this uh, objection quite often. Gospel authors were biased. We can't trust them. Uh, they were Christians. In fact, they go beyond bias. Uh, you have John in John's Gospel saying, I am writing these things in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So he has an objective uh, behind writing. He wants people to become Christians. So it, it's more than just a bias. It's actually propaganda, you could say, that a, a skeptic would say. So there's no question that they were biased. That's certainly the case. Now, um, uh, I'm from Baltimore, so I'm kind of a Ravens fan when it comes to football. And a few years ago, now I, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Ravens were in the Super Bowl against San Francisco, and everybody was thinking the Niners were going to win, and I thought they were going to win because they had a better team that year. And it seemed like they were unstoppable, but the Ravens just were just amazing, and they were crushing the 49ers all the way into the half, and even coming out of the half, they the, the Ravens just ran it back for a touchdown, the kickoff, and thinking, oh, they're just running away with this. But the lights went out, and then they lost momentum, and the Niners came back, and then it came down to the last minute of the game. And so they go back to, to pass, and if the Niners catch this on the, on the touchdown, they win. If they drop it, they lose, and it just sailed over his fingertips. The problem is there was a little bit of contact in the end zone. And, but the refs didn't call it. So I remember the Niners coach at that point, he's just jumping up, just screaming about the, at the, at the ref saying, why did you call that? And if you're a 49ers fan, I can understand it. You're saying, did, what's wrong with you, ref? Did you get paid? I mean, you bumped into him in the end zone. It's past interference. We get one more shot at it. That's if you're a Niners fan. If you're a Ravens fan like me, you're saying, that wasn't interference. This is football. Let him play. <laughs> right? Our biases impact how we view things, don't they? Um, you know, I, I uh, had a debate last year with John Dominic Crossan, and um, I was talking about bias, biases, and I said um, they, they had just concluded the Brett Kavanaugh hearings at that point. And I said, so, do you believe Brett Kavanaugh? Or do you believe, uh, what was her first name? It's up Ford. What, what is it? Christine Lazy. Christine Lazy Ford. Do you believe her? Do you believe Kavanaugh? And I said, I'll bet you that if you don't like Kavanaugh, you believed her. <laughs> if you liked Kavanaugh, then you believed him. Before you even looked at it, it's pretty much split on party lines. Um, so and that's because our biases get in the way. Now, of course, we could look at the evidence objectively, and many did, um, but the way it was on social media, it was the same way in the Senate. Everybody was split on party lines. It didn't matter whether, really, he did this or not. It was, if you were a liberal, you didn't, did not want him on the Supreme Court. If you were conservative, you did. And, and so our biases get in the way. They get in the way with something as silly and meaningless as sports. They get in something that has a little more meaning that impacts our lives, such as politics. Do you think when it comes to our world view, that bias is not going to get in the way? Of course it's going to get in the way. So uh, the disciples, of course, the people who wrote the Gospels would have been biased. But you know what? The critics who are criticizing the Gospel authors are biased as well. They're every bit as biased. So you end up having someone like a Garrett Ludeman, who is an atheist New Testament scholar, and in 2004 he wrote a little book called The Resurrection of Christ, and at one point he's referring to another book that he wrote just a few years earlier on the resurrection, and he describes it and he says its aim was to prove the non-historicity of the resurrection of Jesus, and simultaneously to encourage Christians to change their faith accordingly. I am writing these things in order that you may not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Is Ludeman biased? Yep. Is it propaganda in the same way the Gospels would be? Yep. But does that mean that he's wrong? No. He's wrong because his arguments stink. Not because he's biased. Not because he has 
an agenda in writing. What about the militant atheist Richard Dawkins? In his book, uh, The God Delusion, he says, if this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. Is Dawkins biased? Does he have an agenda? Does that mean he's wrong? No. Again, he's wrong because his arguments stink. In fact, so poor are his arguments in that book that the atheist philosopher of science, Michael Roos, says his writing there makes him embarrassed to be an atheist. That's what an atheist philosopher of science said about Dawkins' book. But he has an agenda. But just because you are biased and have an agenda doesn't mean it's wrong. Okay, back in the 70s or 80s, some of you will remember this, there was a commercial on TV where it showed an egg and says, this is your brain, and then it burst it and put it in a frying pan and says, this is your brain on drugs. It's propaganda, right? Doesn't mean it's wrong. So, yes, the gospel authors were biased. If, they, if, if what they're writing about Jesus actually happened, of course they're going to be biased. If you saw him and walked with him and he claimed to be God's uniquely divine son and you saw him perform miracles and rise from the dead, yeah, you're going to be biased, and yes, you're going to have an agenda and preach the gospel, and you want to see people come to know Christ and give their life to Him. That doesn't mean the story you're writing is wrong. So if, if you're going to say that if you're biased and you have an objective uh, agenda in writing, then you're disqualified, then we're going to have to say that an African-American historian could not write on slavery in the United States, and we'd have to say that a Jewish historian could never write on the Holocaust. But yet, those would be the best kind of people to write on those topics, wouldn't it? So, we have to look at arguments. We have to look and say, what, where does the data point? Does the data suggest that what they are saying is true or not? But bias has nothing to do with it. C, contradictions. This is the most, uh, this is the strongest and most frequent objection to the reliability of the Gospels. Now, I'm not going to cover a whole lot of that right now, because tomorrow morning we're going to cover it in a lecture. I'm going to, uh, but I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But I do want to cover a little bit right now. When we talk about contradictions in the Gospels, we want to keep the matter in perspective. Okay? So, a little over 100 years ago, there was the Titanic, and it sank. The iceberg, and it sank. And more than half of its passengers died. Of the survivors, some of them said that the Titanic broke in half before it sank, and others said, nope, it went down in one piece. Now, how do you get that wrong? It's the most terrifying night of your life. You're in a life raft, and all you can see, it's a little over 800 feet long, it's all lit up, and screams are coming from it. And some said it broke in half and sank, and others said, nope, it went down in one piece. I don't know how they got that wrong. But we know one thing, you didn't turn around and say, well, I guess the Titanic didn't sink. What we said would say is that one of, or some of the eyewitnesses got it wrong. But the story that the Titanic sank was indisputable. The bottom line is this, even if there were some contradictions in the Gospels, it wouldn't mean that its overall theme and story was mistaken. Virtually every piece of ancient history and biography has some problems with it. But we don't say we can't know anything about what happened to Julius Caesar, even though of all the different accounts we have, Appian, Cicero, Dio, Livy, Plutarch, Sway, uh, Tonius, Tacitus, Valius, they talk about Caesar's assassination and they contradict on numerous details, far more than what we typically find in the Gospels. And yet, we're going to say that we can know a lot about that. We may not know who it was who brought, who withheld Antony to keep him from coming into the theater. We may not know um, a, 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 what time he came in. And there's a number of things that we may not know about the assassination of Caesar. But we know that we get a general idea of the details of what went there. So even if we couldn't resolve things in differences in the Gospels, like, was there one angel, or were there two at the empty tomb? How many women went to the tomb? Was there one Mary Magdalene, or were there many? Even, we do have answers to those, but even if we didn't, and even if our answers were mistaken, it wouldn't mean that the tomb was not empty when Jesus didn't rise. 
you have to keep this in perspective. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Period. And there's nothing that changes that. There are no objections that are given by skeptics that would change that. Um, I can remember years ago, before I really got into scholarship, I hadn't even finished my master's degree, and I started to get out there and share my faith with some, and they'd bring up these different objections that I didn't know how to answer. And I remember, this is the day before the internet, it's before email, we're talking about the 1980s. And I'd call my friend Gary Habermas, who was a philosophy professor, and I'd say, what would you do with this? I mean, some people are saying that Matthew didn't write Matthew, and we have no idea who wrote the Gospels. I mean, well, gosh, how can I trust Christianity? He said, Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah. How do we know that? Well, we got Paul, and, you know, he was an eyewitness, and he knew the Jerusalem apostles, and we can establish it through Paul. All right, so Mike, even if, let's say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write the Gospels, is Christianity still true? Yeah. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. So if, Christian, if, if Jesus rose, Christianity is true, right? Yes. Well, then why would it destroy your faith if we didn't know who wrote the Gospels? I don't know. So a month passes by. Call Cavern Mass again. There's contradictions in the Gospels. I'm looking at these. They're plain. You know what do I do with these? Did Jesus rise from the dead, Mike? Yeah. So, is Christianity true then? Yeah? Alright, why did this bother you so much? Oh. Alright, All right, well what about genocide in the Old Testament? Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? We've got answers to some of these, but even if we're wrong, if Jesus rose from the dead, is Christianity still true? Even if there was genocide in the Old Testament? Yeah. Alright, so why does that bother you so much? It can bother you, just don't let it bother you and keep it in perspective. Don't let it bother you further than it should. It shouldn't rock the foundation of your faith as though if we find one mistake in the Bible that we can't trust any of it. That doesn't make sense. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Period. And thousands of people became Christians based on the apostolic preaching before the very first piece of New Testament literature was written. So, how could any problems with the New Testament literature negate the truth of Christianity when it was true for decades before the first piece was even written? You see what I'm saying here? And we get this, as soon as I came to understand, because of the evidence that I'd studied about the resurrection, as soon as I came to understand thoroughly that Jesus rose from the dead, these things stopped bothering me as much. It didn't mean that I stopped looking into them. Or that I thought that they weren't important at all. They're still important. Okay. But they're not so important that my faith should be bothered <coughs> by it, is what I'm saying. Then we have to look and say, is there a contradiction or a difference? So when we say the Titanic broke in half, the Titanic didn't break in half, that is a contradiction. There's no way to reconcile that. But let's say I go home on Sunday night, and I walk in the front door, and my wife is just really excited. She said, you're not going to believe this, but an hour ago, I, the doorbell rang, and there was this guy with this huge check from Publishers Clearinghouse, and said, we won. We are millionaires now. Cool. And then a half an hour later, I hear her talking to her mom on the phone, and said, you're not going to believe this, but an hour and a half ago, I was at the computer answering email. And I uh, heard a knock at the door, doorbell rang, and I go, and there are two guys at the door, and one is holding this big check, and the guy filming it said, congratulations, you are now a millionaire. She gets off the phone and says, well, you contradicted yourself, because you said there was just one guy at the door, and you told your mom that there were two. How can I trust anything that you said? And she says, well, I didn't say there was just one. I only mentioned one. The one with the check, because that's the one I knew you would be interested in hearing about. <laughs> we do this kind of stuff all the time, don't we? There's this kind of stuff that goes on in the Gospels all the time. So, for example, how many women went to the tomb? John reports Mary Magdalene. Whereas the other Gospels say that there were several women who went to the tomb. Well, which was it? Well, John doesn't say just Mary Magdalene, but he does mention 
only Mary Magdalene. It says Mary Magdalene got up while it was still dark, went to the tomb, found it empty, ran back. Peter and the beloved disciples said, they have taken the Lord and we don't know where they laid him. Who's we? Isn't that interesting? And then who runs to the tomb? Well, John's Gospel says Peter and the beloved disciple got up and ran to the tomb and found it as Mary had said. In John's Gospel, it says Peter got up and ran to the tomb and found it as the women had said. Well, which one was it? Just Peter? Or is it Peter and the beloved disciple? Well, Luke doesn't say just Peter. He only mentions Peter. But you go 12 verses later, and now it's the Emmaus disciples, and Jesus is talking to them, and it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And, and he says, guys, why the long faces? And they say, well, don't you know what's going on here in Jerusalem? Are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened the last couple days? And Jesus says, what? It must have been fun playing with them, keeping their eyes, being like uh, Star Trek. Yeah. You won't recognize me. You know? um, and, and then he's playing with them. Are you the only guy that doesn't know what's happening? No, guys, tell me what happened. Well, there's this guy named Jesus, and we thought he was the Messiah, but the Romans killed him the other day. But some of our women folk went to the, the tomb this morning, and they said it was empty, and angels were there and said that he'd been raised from the dead. And then some of our own, some of our own went to the tomb, plural, some of our own went to the tomb and found it as women had said. But wait a minute, Luke, 12 verses earlier, you said just Peter. No, I didn't say just Peter. I only mentioned Peter, he's the lead disciple. But obviously he knew there were others. Same kind of stuff. Is it a contradiction or is it a difference? Just because it's a difference doesn't mean it's a contradiction. And then tomorrow, I'm going to cover something pretty big about the Gospels as biography. And, and, and show you, I, I discovered something a few years back, and it just changes the way that we can approach gospel differences. And it, I, I don't know about you guys, well, some of you will know what I'm talking about. I'm going to be 58 in July, and when I was a kid, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, I remember one Christmas I got this book. It was like a coloring book, but it wasn't. And you open it up, and there were all these lines, scribbles, and it just didn't make any sense. Well, this book came with two pair of, like, sunglasses. But they, they were like cardboard, and they had these, uh, you know, like, see, some of you know what I'm talking about. And one set of the sunglasses had red lenses in it, and the other had blue lenses in it. And you put the blue lenses on, and you look at all that scribble, and it's like, it's just scribble. And then you put the red lenses on, and it's like, whoa, okay, I see it. You had to look at it through the right lens. And what I found is that we are reading the Gospels through the lens of 21st century, how we do history in the 21st century. But they didn't operate by the same rules in the first century that we do now. And so when you learn how they wrote biography and history in the first century, and then you read the Gospels through the lenses of first century biography, it's like, whoa! There's lots of stuff that changes. Stuff with Christological implications and things that have to do with the Gospel differences so that I think more, well, way more than 90% of the differences in the Gospels are resolved by reading the Gospels through its proper lens. And I'm going to show you how to do it tomorrow. And when I do this with my students, they just like, wow, this is awesome. And I'm saying, it's from now on, it will be like reading the Gospels for the first time again. And it's really cool. So I'll show you that tomorrow morning. The fourth, the D is for dating. How do we date the Gospels? Well, you'll have some critics say, well, the Gospels were written, you know, maybe 35 to 70 years after Jesus, way too long after the events they purport to describe. And we just can't trust it. It's too long after. Now, I, I think that's bunk. <laughs> you know, it's like any, I don't think any of you here are old enough for to be a World War II vet, and probably not even Korean, no one here from Korean vet, right? What about Vietnam? 
Vietnam? Korean? Korean. Really? Awesome. Thanks for your service. Very much. Wow. Did you see combat over there? No, it was over six months after I got in. Oh, well that's fortunate for you. That was really rough, I hear. So, um, any Vietnam vets? Anybody who's seen combat? Anybody seen combat? No? But a Vietnam vet, thanks for your, your service. So, uh, when you... You see these things on the History Channel and some of these specials that come out where they're interviewing Vietnam, Korean War, World War II vets. We have some World War II vets at our church. One flew on a, I think a B-24, B-25, one of those. Uh, pretty cool. He's got some great stories. Um, so when you talk to these folks, though, you know, they still remember things, even though this happened like 70 years ago, right? 70, almost 75 years ago, the war was over. And they can still remember in the History Channel, we'll interview them and we do documentaries on even Vietnam. What was that? 20, 45 years ago, the war ended in Vietnam. And yet people can still remember their combat experiences. Now, that's not to say that every detail they will remember. Okay, um, so I mean, I've got a, a neighbor who lives a couple houses down. He saw a lot of combat in Vietnam, and it's kind of messed him up. He, uh, I, I love to hear stories, so I, I, I'll take him to lunch and I'll ask him, you know, tell me something what happened. And he's just starting to open up, um, but he, you know, they just keep it to themselves. Um, but they can remember. Now, maybe they might confuse a place, one battle with another. They might confuse some names or some things like that, but they're going to get the gist of what happened, even after all that time. Um, so I, it's really difficult to think that when we're talking 35 to 65, 70 years later, that these guys aren't going to remember. Um, so if you saw the movie of, uh, We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson and Sam Elliott, it was about the first engagement in the Vietnam War between U.S. troops and the North Vietnamese Army. It happened a, th a three or four days battle in uh, the Yadrang River Valley in Vietnam in November 1965. And if you saw that movie, the combat reporter, Joe Galloway, um, was, was over there. And uh, my wife and I watched a documentary a few years ago called Vietnam in HD. And in the very first episode, they interviewed Galloway. And at one point, there was a one-minute video, and it was just really touching. I wish I'd put it in here, but I didn't. I, I have it for another lecture. But um, in there, he, he starts to tear up, and he just talks about things. And then it, at one point, he says that these four days, three, four days of battle, he says, these things, you see it, you experience it, you live it, and it will be with you all of your days. And you see people blown up, friends in front of you, and you just remember these things. And so then I wonder, if you had been with Jesus, and you saw him heal the blind, you saw him heal lepers, you saw him take people who were paralyzed and raise them so that now they could walk, you saw him walk on water, you saw him raise the dead, and then you saw him brutally executed. And then shortly thereafter, you saw him again in perfect health. Do you think that that would leave an impression on you? That was at least as deep and lasting as those three or four days of battle left on Joe Galloway? Of course it would. And then I think about Jesus' teachings. It's not like that battle that Joe Galloway was in that happened three or four days and then nothing happened, you know, like after that, like a repeat of it. They may have repeated the story over time, but it happened once. Now, Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He didn't have to come up with a new sermon in every town he went to. He probably had a dozen or so sermons, and he preached those over and over and over and over, countless times. And, and then... He sent his disciples out, and they preached the same thing over and over and over and over. And then he'd come back and debrief with Jesus, 
And they'd say, okay, now when you're talking to Jews, you can tell the parable this way, but if you're talking to Gentiles, they won't understand this. So do a cultural translation for them and tell it this way to drive the point home. Oh, thanks, Jesus. And so they watch him do it, and then they do it. And then after Jesus leaves them and ascends to heaven, now for the next several decades, they teach the same things over and over and over, and you get the idea, right? So it's not something that just happened once, and then they walked away and tried to recall it 35 or 40 years later. They had been preaching it hundreds, perhaps thousands of times, between the time Jesus had said it many times, and then they wrote it down. So the dating of the Gospels really isn't a problem. And in fact, when you consider Plutarch writing in the case, some cases hundreds of years later, but even in the case of Caesar and the fall of the Roman Republic and his change into empire, he's writing about 150 years later, 140 to 150 some years later. The Gospels are 20 to 70 years later. Alexander the Great, our two finest sources on it are Arian of Nicomedia, written about 425 years later, and Plutarch, who writes about 440 years after uh, Alexander. And we're going to complain about the Gospels of 20 to 70 years later? Are you serious? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 20 to 70 years later. Eyewitness testimony, E for eyewitness. Critics will say, well, the Gospels aren't written by eyewitnesses. They don't contain eyewitness testimony. The reason uh, they'll say that is they'll say, you know, if I, you know, the game of telephone we played as a kid, I whisper something in your ear and something in your ear, you whisper to the person. By the time you get to the back of the room, there's different stories, right? And so what happens with the Gospel authors, they've gone through hundreds of people for at least 35 years, and the format the story had taken by the end of that time, that's what got included in the Gospels. That seems to assume that shortly after Jesus' death,